Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Muller. I'm the head of marketing with Enough Data. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, so today we have four speakers, uh, namely uh, Manfred Hafner, who is professor of energy economics with uh, Sciences Po in Paris. Hi, Manfred. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, also, we have um, uh, Morgan Krines, who is head of our innovation and research department. Hi, Morgan. Hello, everybody. Uh, then we have Benoit Prunel, who is our senior consultant in, in uh, energy climate. Hi, Benoit. Hi, everyone. And last but not least, Quentin Bikini, Bikini, Bikini sorry, it's hard to pronounce, uh, is about to join us in, the, in a 10 minute time. Uh, right, so um, thanks very much for um, being here today. Um, basically, um, uh, the, the webinar will, will last about an hour, right? Um, about you know, 45 to 50 minute presentation, followed by Q&A. So this is to say you may ask your question anytime by using the Q&A button of the Zoom interface. So feel free to do so over the course of the whole webinar and we'll be answering the questions at the end of this session, right? Um, so yeah, um, as, as some of you may know, um, Ana Data has been presenting the global energy trends every year for four years, if not, if not decades. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the exercise has become a little bit more comprehensive now because besides the, uh, the statistics, you know, that we just consolidated, I'm talking about the 2021 statistics, um, we're doing a little bit of uh, foresight, you know, because obviously uh, it's nice to, to take a look at the rear view mirror, but what everyone wants to know is what's going to happen over the next few months and let alone over the next few years. Uh, given that we are facing a double dip uh, crisis, i.e. Uh, the pandemic, of course, and its uh, consequences on, on the economy, and in particular on the energy systems. And uh, of course, now on top of that comes the uh, Ukraine crisis, which has tremendous, uh, tremendous impact as well. Um, so to start with, we're going to we're going to start with the rearview mirror. So what happened in 2021 and what, what, what are the consolidated uh, statistics? So for this, I leave the floor to Benoit Prunel. Uh, Benoit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I'm, I'm indeed very pleased to present uh, our latest statistics. Um, and I'm trying to answer the question, um, where do we come from in terms of um, energy balance uh, at the G20 level. Uh, why G20? Uh, because they contribute to more than 80% of the global GDP. Um, and um, they give uh, significant trends about uh, the direction of the energy system globally. So my discussion today uh, will be focused on um, commenting um, our latest numbers, um, looking at three dimensions. Uh, one is the economy. Uh, second is the energy needed to fuel this economy. And the third dimension, um, the side effects, and namely the emissions um, from the combustion of energy uh, related um, to this. Uh, so, so what are the latest numbers? Um, we had a, a, a massive um, economic contraction uh, during 2020. Um, and in 2021, uh, we see uh, the economic recovery, uh, the economy uh, bounced back um, at a level above where it was in 2019, um, plus 5.9%. And uh, we see uh, the final energy consumption going in the same direction, also plus 5% in 2021. And together with this, uh, we also see emissions uh, growing at the same speed as the economy at plus 5.9% in 2021. Um, so we, we're gonna analyze more into the details, uh, the drivers uh, behind the, those trends. So regarding the economy, um, 
has been a bounce back in 2021, uh, but with uh, different speeds, uh, whether you look at OECD countries or non-OECD countries. OECD countries grew at 4.9% um, in 2021, uh, with a very strong re um, rebound in the US and uh, a less, uh, I would say, less strong rebound for EU and Japan um, in 2021. Um, if we look at non-OECD countries, um, the growth was especially uh, stronger, plus 7% in 2021, even plus 8.1% for China, uh, and India 8.9% uh, rebound in 2021. Um, so um, there is indeed a differentiated um, growth uh, among OECD and non-OECD countries. Um, and it translates um, into also differentiated uh, consumption among countries. So in terms of consumptions, we're about the same level as 2019 uh, in 2021, um, uh, plus 5% uh, at G20 level, but again, with um, differentiated um, depending on the countries. The United States uh, plus 4.7 percent rebounds in 2021, um, about the same level for EU uh, plus 4.5 percent. Um, the growth uh, was uh, even stronger in 2021 for non-OECD, um, plus 5.2 percent increase in 2021 for China, and plus 4.7 percent rebounds in India in 2021. Um, so this is kind of a leveling of um, the contraction of 2020, um, uh, but uh, not exactly as strong as the economy. However, if we look um, into uh, the energy intensity, uh, we see uh, interesting trends uh, going on. Uh, energy intensity is defined as the ratio between the energy consumption and the GDP. It's a way to measure how much energy is needed by the economy. And uh, the lower the intensity, the better. It means uh, you need less energy uh, to run your economy. Um, over the last 20 years, um, the intensity has been increasing by an average of a um, minus 1.5 person per year. Um, but what we see in the recent years is that uh, the intensity is still improving, uh, but not as fast as it used to be. Um, in 2021, the intensity was improved by only minus one percent. And this is um, indeed uh, below where it was uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Um, but uh, more important is that it is far beyond where it should be if the G20 was to follow um, the three targets of the Paris Agreement, G20 should be following a, a minus 3.5% decrease per year. And um, in 2021, uh, this is not where we are heading. Now, if we look at CO2 emissions, uh, emissions from uh, energy, energy related emissions, um, 2021 bounce back at a level above uh, where it was in 2018, um, plus 5.9% in 2021. And um, the growth was mainly focused on, um, I would say, carbon intensive economies. In non-OECD countries, um, China following a, a plus 6.3% uh, increase in 2021. Um, after a small increase of a relative uh, increase of 1.3% in 2020. And again, um, if we look um, at uh, the general trend of those emissions, uh, we can measure it uh, through the carbon factor defined as the ratio uh, between the CO2 emissions and the energy consumption. Um, this ratio uh, used to be at something like minus 0.7% since 2014. 
um, improving from year to year, still not exactly um, on track uh, to follow the two degrees pathway defined by the Paris Agreement. Uh, but there, what we see in 2021 is that actually this carbon factor is going into the opposite direction. Um, it actually was degraded uh, with uh, an increase of nearly plus one percent. Um, so 2021 actually um, wasn't really the year of decoupling uh, emissions uh, from the economic growth. Let's look now um, a little bit into the details uh, by energy. Um, as I said before, the overall final energy consumption grew by plus 5% in 2021. Um, but there are quite different trends by energy. Clearly, uh, gas uh, was the winner uh, with an increase of plus 5.5%, an increase above um, the average across all energies. Um, and electricity also uh, followed uh, a growth path um, with plus 5.4% in 2021. Um, coal was pretty much aligned uh, with the overall trend of energy consumption with um, plus 5%. And uh, this is um, pretty much a surprise after several years of uh, slow growth or decline. Um, so there has been a kind of a comeback of coal um, as um, a source of dispatchable energy um, in 2021. Um, in terms of, um, I would say, energy efficiency, the only good news is that um, the level of oil consumption did not come back to where it was in 2019 after an historical, historical contraction of minus 8.2% in 2020 it grew by a mere 4.4% in 2021, and not enough to compensate uh, for the diminution from the previous year. Um, for the sake of time management, um, we, I am not going to deep dive on each energy, um, but you will have access to a detailed analysis um, that will be sent to you after um, this webinar. Uh, where we detail uh, the trends by energy. Uh, however, uh, before closing, um, I would like to comment on uh, the trends of renewables. Uh, wind and solar have been um, going through the crisis uh, with a steady growth, a double digit growth, both for 2020 and 21. And uh, wind experienced a rather um, exceptional bursts in terms of production in 2021, um, especially for China, um, as the result of added capacity in 2020. Um, there was a kind of a windfall effect in 2020 in China uh, related to um, tariff and regulation, uh, which triggered a, a massive increase of capacities in 2020. Um, but as you can see on the right hand side of the graphic, um, those added capacities did not follow the same trend. Uh, it's still growing fast in 2021, uh, but not as fast as in 2020. So we could potentially expect in 2022, um, the production from wind um, to be not as aggressive as it has been in 2021. It's time now to synthesize uh, the analysis uh, of the G20 numbers. Um, so what are the key takeaways? Uh, first, uh, the econo economic activity grew again in 2021 to a level above where it was in 2019. And as a direct consequence, CO2 emission also rebounded um, in 2021 and they more than offset the drop um, of 2020. Uh, so the COVID crisis um, explained uh, this uh, cyclical effect of 2020 and 2021. It impacted mainly uh, the services or tertiary uh, sector, the transport sector, and it is still impacting the transport sector and also carbon intensive electricity generation. Um, 
another key takeaway is that uh, there was no, nearly no crisis effect uh, on uh, new capacities for renewable sources, uh, both for wind and solar. They've been growing steadily um, across uh, the years 2020 and 21. Um, but this growth was not enough uh, to bring back uh, the key indicators of energy efficiency and decarbonization um, to the trends needed uh, to meet uh, the Paris agreements. So the, the brave new world uh, we would be hoping for at the beginning of the COVID crisis um, did not happen. Uh, in 2021, uh, we didn't see um, a decoupling of economic growth and emissions uh, growth. Thank you very much. And giving the floor back to um, Morgan, I guess. Thanks, Benoit. Thanks very much. Um, now we'll switch to the second part of this presentation. Looking forward up to 2030. Um, so we'll address how energy systems can face all those current events uh, sanitary crisis, uh, war in Ukraine, uh, high prices, inflation, economic slowdown. There are also some good news with the uh, penetration of, of renewable, as mentioned by, by Benoit. So we'll, we'll do this with, firstly by looking uh, at energy prices and uh, we'll see uh, what stories are telling us. And secondly, by exploring uh, some energy and climate scenarios uh, focusing on the European gas crisis. So now we can move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so here you see uh, the historical evolution of uh, Brent price in orange. Uh, it's the uh, right axis. And the natural gas, uh, European gas price in blue uh, on the left axis uh, for the past 15 years, basically. So the first observation is a correlation between uh, both prices since historically um, gas contracts have been indexed to, uh, to oil price, but they also share the same drivers. Uh, now, if we, if we look at Brent price, uh, we can see it has been quite volatile across the years. Uh, we had this peak in 2008, just before the financial crisis. Then, of course, a drop, a rebound. Uh, in, in 2015, a downward trend um, from this abundant uh, supply from uh, US shale oil and gas, then going up again with the uh, strong growth in, in Asia. And in 2020, uh, oil price facing uh, COVID uh, restriction. Um, so uh, a big drop before the economic rebound and now uh, amplified by uh, why in Ukraine. Um, now, if we look at uh, natural gas price in blue, we have pretty much the same variation, except maybe um, a decrease in 2019 from an oversupply of LNG in, in, in Europe. Um, but the main difference uh, is uh, the magnitude of, of the shock, of the current shock in price. Um, now, if we look at, at brand price, we have already experienced, um, we have already experienced the, um, uh, uh, this level of price in 2008, but for gas price, it's uh, unprecedented. We are now at um, five or six times higher than um, historical average at 20 euros per mega megawatt hour. So um, it's, a, it's a huge difference. Now we'll focus on, uh, on what's going on right now and, and forward price. So we, we can move to the next slide. Please. Okay, thanks. So here on this graph, uh, in the plane lines, you have um, you have um, um, the spot price for Brent and uh, gas price, and the dot line is um, is, a, is a forward price. So basically, uh, today the price you pay to uh, uh, to buy or sell um, uh, gas or oil to be delivered in one year, two years, or, or three years. So if we look at uh, forward price for Brent, um, it is expected to, to, to go down in, in, the, in the near term. It's not a big surprise since with um, uh, current economic slowdown, inflation, 
uh, lockdowns in China, we expect to have less pressure from all demand in the coming months. Um, and at the same time, we, we could um, uh, have a reduction of, of supply, oil supply deficit. Um, for gas, it's not the same story. Uh, you can see that there is a plateau forecast up to uh, 2024. 20, uh, currently, uh, we have very tight uh, energy market in Europe, so not really um, uh, supply alternatives. And Europe is really exposed to uh, uh, unilateral Russian decisions, for example, to cut exports uh, through uh, Nord Stream 1. A uh, few uh, days ago, it was cut by 60%. Uh, it could be cut uh, by uh, 70 or 100%. We, we do not know. And um, European market is, is also exposed to, um, to adverse events, such as LNG outages. Uh, and this was the case a few, a few days ago in Freeport, uh, a US LNG terminal shipping uh, a good part of LNG to, uh, to Europe. So, um, um, even in, in, in the midterm up to uh, 2025, 20, 2026, you can see that um, um, uh, forward price are not going back to, uh, to the average uh, level at 20 euros per megawatt hour. So there is re really, um, uh, the, the market is really tight. And now I think that the main issues for Europe will be to, to face next winter. Um, uh, the issue is to be able to fill uh, gas storage by November, by the start of heating season. Uh, and it will require probably uh, some specific and urgent actions on demand to reduce um, uh, gas demand. Um, so it, it's a good transition for the, the next topic about uh, gas crisis in Europe. So we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so now we will address this issue in, of gas crisis in the EU. Uh, so how did it start uh, and when did it start? Uh, we could say that it was just after some post-pandemic rebound. Uh, we had at the same time um, surging prices and um, some difficulty to, uh, to, to inject gas in storage. Um, now, if we put some context, um, and we, um, we can see where gas is consumed in, in Europe. Um, if you look at the graph on the left side, you can see that a good part of uh, gas is consumed in the, the power and energy sector. Then uh, we have buildings, residential and tertiary, of which 75% is going to um, heating. And then we have industry and other sectors. So power and energy and buildings account for one third each to uh, gas primary consumption. And it's roughly equivalent to uh, all the gas uh, shipped by Russia uh, by pipe. Um, so it means that um, gas uh, is strategic for, for Europe because it satisfies basic needs such as heating, um, power sector. In the power sector, it, it can bring also uh, flexibility uh, gas has a lower carbon content, content compared to other fossil fuel, oil and, and, and coal. So that's why in, in February uh, this year, the European Commission has endorsed uh, natural gas as a transition fuel. But on the other side, um, you can see on the, on the graph on, on the right side that the share of natural gas import uh, compared to uh, total gas consumption has increased uh, strongly over the year. And now um, um, we have this, this issue about security of supply with the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, 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 was always, it was already the case, if you look at, at, the, at the past trends, uh, relying more and more on imports, and especially, of course, on Russian uh, imports. So it means that in a, just in a couple of uh, weeks, um, gas uh, status has, has changed from uh, transition fuel, uh, the taxonomy, EU taxonomy, to a threat in security of supply. If you look at the uh, repower re EU plan um, unveiled by uh, the European Commission uh, with options to, uh, to diversify um, um, gas supply and to reduce uh, gas uh, demand. So this is quite uh, interesting. 
So now I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Quentin uh, to, um, to address this issue about the gas crisis in the EU. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Um, so can you go to the next slide? I don't know who has control. OK, thank you very much. So um, so first, the idea is to you know take a look back um, from, from what Morgan has just said and, and, and look at what the, the historic situation uh, is for the EU in terms of natural gas consumption related to uh, natural gas imports, right? And what you see on the, on, the, on the graph on the left is that, well, the EU relies a lot uh, on imports, about 84% based on 2019 figures. And this, this, the sources of, this, uh, of these natural gas imports are not very diversified. Right, so that's uh, straight away you see that there is there is an issue with that, and obviously um, among those sources, Russia accounts for more than forty percent uh, of of the EU import. So this is obviously specifically in in the current uh, context a, a really big issue. Um, now, if you look at because obviously this is limited to the spectrum, you know, to the perimeter of, of the of the EU, right? But there's a lot of there is some some uh, domestic production in Europe. Uh, and especially if you account for Norway and the UK, so most of the European production um, is located in North in the North Sea, right? So even though the domestic production from the EU is quite low, around 16%, you still have imports from Norway and the UK, which if if you account for those two countries, you would you would this would amount to 40%. But still, this this definitely an issue because that that would still mean that 60% of that is is gas imports. So. What we want to look at uh, in the next few slides is, you know, how basically how can we uh, become independent from, especially from uh, Russian gas sub, uh, supply, but not just as a, you know, an em emergency measure, uh, but mostly, uh, you know, something that could be sustainable in the long term. And basically, because we already have quite ambitious uh, policies that are going to be implemented over the over the next few years, um, how, what exactly can we sort of tweak? To make sure that this energy transition that is already, you know, underway, how can this be also um, aligned with with uh, becoming independent from Russian and natural gas? So that will that will basically be two main things. Um, on the one hand, reducing uh, demand for natural gas, and obviously diversify uh, the the natural gas supply. Can you? Yeah. Thanks. So um, if you look at exactly. Um, I mean, exactly how much uh, gas in terms of volumes we import from Russia, you have this figure of 190 BCM. I think this is, and this was on purpose, this is a figure from 2019, because we don't yet have all consolidated figures uh, regarding imports for 2021. And obviously 2020 was an odd year. So there's a lot of analysis that was based on the figure for 2020, which was lower, but I think 190, the figure pre-COVID, is most likely more representative of what's the actual um, requirement in terms of, of uh, imports from Russia in natural gas. So now let's look at you know the other components, the way we see it, how can this change uh, up to 2030? Um, first, there's one component that, I mean, we believe is actually going to be adding to the current problem, which is the potential decrease in, in European production, right, including Norway and the UK. So there's a lot of publications on that. The general consensus is that it's going to go down. Uh, the uh, reserves on, on production ratios are quite low. There's not going to be massive investment in, in exploration that will lead to discoveries by, by 2030. We don't, we don't think it, that's realistic. So we ended up with this figure of, of around 30 BCM, which was, again, which will add to the current um, issue because that's, that's all the more uh, you know, volumes that we need to um, substitute. Now, looking at potential diversif diversification of supply. So this would mostly go through LNG, not in the very short term. Although if you look at regasification capacities, there's actually about 40 BCM per year that uh, should be added, right? If you take into account the projects that have been approved or even the project under construction, you have around 40 BCM of additional regasification capacity in the EU by 2023. Right, so you can also table on more than that by by 2030 if there's necessary, you know, incentives to invest in, in those regasification capacity. But then the problem is, you know, the the required ramp up of uh, production from exporters to to be able to use these because, I mean, we're currently at I think 
between 40 and 50 percent uh, utilization rates for these capacity. So it's not really, at least from a European perspective, it's not really a problem of capacity, but but it's a problem of you know getting the getting the supply from from exporters, which already are, are you know bided by by uh, contracts. Um, so there's going to be most likely a ramp up. Uh, we estimated it at around 60 BCM. That's actually a figure from the Repower EU plan that we that we just reused, and I think it makes sense. Um, uh, compared to the expected increase in capacity and considering that there are countries like the US or Qatar that could increase their production. You might also have some potential from rerouting of existing, uh, existing exchange uh, flows between countries, especially if you look at you know, Russia probably um, finding um, other, other, other clients, other, um, other countries to export their natural gas to. Uh, although again, this is not a this is not a zero sum game. So obviously, there's going to be a growing demand. So I don't know how much that will factor in. And then you have uh, the potential for actually decarbonizing the gas. So without changing anything from the final demand perspective, you can actually blend uh, biogas and uh, maybe even hydrogen or substitute uh, those two to natural gas, which was you know, diminish. But we we see that from the point of view of the supply. But it, this would actually reduce the demand for. Uh, natural gas. So what we end up with is uh, around 130 BCM that needs to be replaced, you know, or compensated by on, on the demand side, right? This is our perspective. If you look at, obviously, this was before the crisis, but if you look at the uh, European Commission scenarios um, uh, that, were, that, was, that were aligned with the Fit for 55 policy package, right, the, the mix scenario to be, to be more precise, um, they actually tabled on a reduction of around 90 BCM. So that means that there's already going to be a substantial reduction in, in natural gas um, uh, domestic consumption uh, in the EU. But it's, it's looking at this, it's, it's not going to be enough to be completely independent from, from Russian gas. So if you can go to the next slide, I will detail a little bit more what we expect um, uh, could happen, at least in the, on the demand side. So this is based on the Ener Green scenario. So Ener Green is a scenario. Um, that in the future, there are um, three scenarios that we produce uh, here at Ener Data. Um, so the Ener Base scenario is basically a scenario based on you know historical trends without many much effort to reduce um, uh, energy consumption and and uh, and related GHG emissions. The Ener Blue scenario is a scenario that is basically in line with the NDCs from different countries around the world. And the energy scenario is a much more ambitious scenario, which looks at, you know, basically containing the increase in, in global temperatures at, you know, below two degrees uh, Celsius, just to give a bit of context here. And what you see here in the, in the, in the chart on the left is that energy green would actually allow for natural gas demand to decrease by 130 BCM by 2030. So this was not actually a scenario that was built um, with this idea that we need to, um, uh, to be completely independent from, from Russian gas in, in 2030. But it turns out that the figures are actually matching uh, the previous slide with this, this need to decrease. So it's just final demand, right? Without taking into account natural gas input and in power generation. But final demand itself could contribute to reducing uh, natural gas demand enough um, so that we could be independent from, from gas uh, imports from Russia. And if you look at it um, uh, more specifically here, what we've tried to represent is what could be the impact of the different, you know, drivers uh, that we considered in our modeling work. And what you can see is that the switch to heat pumps in, in buildings, so both residential and, and, and tertiary sectors, is the biggest like single contributor uh, across the, the timeline. But industry could play a role, um, not necessarily in the very short term, but after 2025, potentially through a lot of different options. It could be electrification of, of processes, uh, energy efficiency, or both of them being uh, often combined, and, and potentially also other, other factors, such as you know, more circularity, um, less demand for industrial goods, and um, you know, material efficiency, and, and that's, that sort of things. One thing I wanted to highlight as well is the potential of, you know, at, at the bottom you have both efficiency, energy efficiency in buildings, but also sufficiency. So sufficiency, what we mean by sufficiency is rather than just looking at efficiency from, you know, improving equipment or appliances in building sector, 
what what could be done in terms of you know um, well mostly related to behaviors but reducing our demand for energy services so we like to split the two because i think they're the, the incentives are completely different um, but there's definitely a, a big uh, potential here for for energy sufficiency to contribute to this to this lower demand now just at the bottom right uh, you can see the difference the differences between scenarios that we considered here on the one hand the inner future scenarios that i described uh, on the other hand you have the scenarios from the uh, European Commission, so the reference scenario from 2020 and the mix uh, fit for 55 scenario that I mentioned earlier. And you can see that even though Energreen goes way further in terms of reducing uh, natural gas demand, this doesn't include, and I'll get to that in the next slide, this doesn't include potential from the, the, the power generation. Whereas if you add power generation in the, in the fit for 55 mix scenario, uh, you end up with, as I mentioned, around like minus 90, minus uh, 100 BCM per year of, of natural gas demand reduction. Right, if you can go to the next slide, just to conclude on this. Yeah, just a few words about power generation. So like I said, uh, this is not something that we have considered uh, so much in the inner future scenario, because what, what actually happens is that there's no real reduction in, in natural gas demand in the inner future scenarios, um, simply because you know there's there's actually a lot of stakes um, uh, in the, in the power generation sector, and and natural gas could actually be needed to avoid having to well basically what you see in the short term in, in certain countries at the moment, which is you know restarting or increasing the utilization of of coal power plants. Uh, maybe extending lifetime or extending life of a nuclear power plant. So we see gas as being essential still by 2030 in the in the power sector to an extent. Whereas the if you look at here, this is the the um, mix um, scenario for the European Commission. You see a, a decrease in natural gas um, input in in power plants, um, which was reflected in the previous chart. But I would say at this point, there's no consensus that, that the power sector is going to contribute that much to reducing natural gas because there's, there's also a lot of stakes in terms of you know, energy transition and reducing the, the carbon content of, 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 the, of power generation. So I will leave back the floor to Morgan to conclude on, on this. And I think you can go to the next slide as well. Yeah, thank yeah, you. We can go to the next slide. Thanks very much, Quentin. Um, <clears throat> so, very quickly, uh, if you want to sum up uh, what we have said uh, in terms of perspective, um, 2030, um, I would say um, we'll need um, energy savings, uh, energy efficiency, sufficiency, both in the short term to face uh, next winter, uh, particularly in Europe. So, um, uh, by the way, um, um, CEOs from the main three uh, energy utilities in, in France uh, called uh, last Sunday for uh, urgent actions to, to save uh, energy and gas uh, by, by the end of the year. But of course, it will be also a solution for the mid-term and the long-term to achieve um, security of supply, of course, but also other um, um, environmental objectives, uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, and decoupling um, uh, economic growth with uh, um, energy consumption. So um, just before leaving the floor to Manfred, uh, uh, a reminder that um, uh, you can uh, ask all the questions you want uh, in the uh, Q&A uh, uh, section in, in Zoom. So do not hesitate to ask your questions. Uh, and now I will uh, leave the floor to Manfred, an energy expert, um, gas market expert. So um, Manfred, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan. Thank you so much uh, uh, to Enerdata for having uh, inviting, invited me to this uh, interesting session with, with uh, extremely insightful uh, presentation by uh, Morgan, Benoit, and Quentin. And as the presentation has been quite very, very uh, rich in data and information, I, I think I should uh, just uh, uh provide some qualitative uh, comments on the ongoing uh, energy crisis and the potentially looming much more drastic drastic gas crisis in europe in uh, for the next winter and to discuss a little bit uh, the needed uh, uh, 
emergency responses uh, uh, which we should put in place. Fundamentally, I think we are in totally uncharted waters. We are presently seeing a superposition of several crises. We are just trying to exit the COVID-19 pandemic with all its impacts. We have an ongoing uh, climate crisis, which we have so far failed to address uh, properly. We have a full-fledged war in Ukraine in the middle of Europe due to this uh, brutal invasion by Russia on February 24th. Um, uh, we have an energy crisis, which uh, as has been said uh, already, uh, uh, prices, energy price uh, crisis, which have started before the invasion, but which have not, uh, obviously the, the, the war in Ukraine has not helped uh, with the prices, with the energy prices. We have a potentially looming recession because uh, inflation is skyrocketing in all of our countries and uh, the central banks, they need to increase interest rates to stabilize uh, prices. This is the mandate most of the time they have. And uh, by doing so, this may increase, uh, this may induce a recession and potentially destabilize the most indebted countries, including in Europe. And of course, uh, due to the war, we, we have a looming uh, food crisis, which is going to be particularly hurt, hurtful uh, in the developing countries uh, where we may expect uh, um, increased uh, famines. There are plenty of other uh, crises which I'm not going to list, but you already see that we are not talking about one crisis, we are talking about a full portfolio of crises, um, uh, and we need to, to, to navigate through them somehow. Now let me focus on energy. Um, uh, but before I focus on energy, uh, let me just uh, say that uh, I think, and I think we, we all agree, the 24th of Fe February of this year represents a major turning point in Europe and European history, both as far as European security architecture is concerned, and we already see an increased uh, defense spending in most of our countries, as well as potential Eastern expansion of NATO by some countries, to some countries. And at the same time, a new European energy and in particular gas architecture. Now, both have faced uh, tectonic shocks and uh, both the security architecture and the energy architecture they need to be totally redefined and nothing in the future will be as it was over the last decades. On February 24th of this year, Russia, as we know, has invaded Ukraine militarily. And as a result of this, the West has declared an economic war to Russia. With its sanctions, and we have never seen uh, such strong sanctions as we are seeing now to Russia, the West wants to hurt Russia's economy, and by doing so, wants to hurt and to stop Russia's war machine. The problem is that though these sanctions may work and may have an impact uh, in the long run, they are not working in the short run. Russia still has plenty of military capabilities and the plenty of money to conduct its war. For the last uh, uh, four months, March, April, May, for the last four months, months since February 24th until today, June 28th, the EU has transferred 64.5 billion euros to Russia for its hydrocarbon imports, 32 billion for oil imports, 31 billion for gas imports, and 1.7 billion for coal imports. It's depending on the days, it's between half a billion and 1 billion euros per day, which Europe, the European Union, sends to Russia. And this, of course, is also due to the fact that oil and gas prices are extremely high nowadays. 
The, the brand price today is $113 per barrel, higher than it, what it was over the last years. And European gas prices today are around 40 US dollars per million BTU, much higher than what we have uh, 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 known over the last years. Now, the issue is that our governments, they are mainly focusing on reducing oil and gas supply and, and therefore to trying to find substitutions for Russian oil and gas supplies. The issue is, and the problem is, that by doing so, since it is not easy to substitute Russian oil and gas, well, yes, it's easier to substitute oil than gas, but even substituting Russian oil is difficult. You may know that uh, both for oil, as well as for gas, as well as for coal, Russia was the number one supplier for Europe uh, in the past. Um, uh, so it's difficult to get rid of these huge supplies. Uh, uh, and what is going to, what has happened and what will continue to happen is that we are pushing prices up because we need to look for uh, a substitution which is not easily to be found. So what do our politicians do? They realize that the consumers, they are facing higher prices. They are not happy, the consumers. The politicians are afraid that the consumers are no longer going to vote for them in the next elections. And so they distribute gifts to the consumers at, uh, uh, tax uh, rebates uh, on, 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 on prices, uh, price caps, and more. The result of which is going to be macroeconomic imbalances. And at the end of the day, somebody will need to pay the bill. And we know who it is. It is the, the people, the consumers. On March 8th, about the two weeks after, or three weeks after the invasion, the European Commission has launched its Repower EU, aimed at uh, very importantly reducing EU demand for Russian gas by about two thirds before the end of this year, before the end of 2020. Now, knowing that the EU in 2021 has imported uh, 155 BCM of pipeline gas, plus about 15 BCM of LNG, but nobody talks about the LNG. So 150 BCM of pipeline gas, which the European Commission wants to reduce by two thirds, which means slightly more than 100 BCM. This is terribly difficult. How does the Commission want to address this? Well, they say 50 BCM by uh, uh, should, be, should be substituted, uh, uh, 50 BCM of Russian gas out of the 100 should be substituted with increased LNG supplies. It's not clear where these LNG supplies are going to come from. Yes, they may come, uh, they, there is little, about 10, 15 max of uh, new LNG, which may come uh, from additional uh, uh, gas, even though we, we, we should not experience any more uh, supply interruptions, as, as we have seen uh, uh, recently, uh, of LNG. Um, uh, uh, but the rest can only be supplied to Europe by convincing people who already have contracts to receive this uh, LNG, which is mainly, which are mainly uh, 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 consumers in Asia, to not take that LNG and send it to us. How can this be achieved? By paying a much higher price. So we are pushing up the prices. Um, there are other, other measures that the commission says, well, 20 BCM could be, could be achieved with an accelerated deployment of wind and solar. So more than what was already planned, about 10 BCM from Norway, North Africa, and Azerbaijan, 40 BCM to energy savings, and, uh, and some further volumes, five to 10 BCM by bio, biomethane, solar roofs, and heat pumps, all of which is very challenging. Now, due to this uncertainty, so we are saying we, are, we, are, we want to cut off Russian gas. 
It's like us, it's like you uh, uh, telling your husband, your, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, I'm going to dump you, I'm going to, to, to abandon you, but not right now because right now I still need you in a year time. Chances are that your partner is going to dump you before you have a chance in dumping him or her and, and possibly at the moment which is the least uh, favorable for you. As we can already see, uh, Russia is already reducing gas supplies, has already stopped supplying gas to some, some uh, consumers, in particular those who have not accepted paying in rubles and not in dollars or euros uh, their gas, because Russia has a problem, uh, has a, a problem of, of reconverting the dollars or the euros into rubles. Um, uh, we have already heard uh, and we know that uh, Russia has uh, reduced the gas supply through Nord Stream. So we can see that there is a huge uncertainty in the market and of course market reacts with this kind of uncertainties with prices going up. So what is it what we need to do? We, we need to address hands-on demand issues. Demand issues is something our politicians normally do not like because it is intrusive and people do not like intrusive measures. But by applying strong demand re reduction strategies, the gas price will come down significantly. Remember the Corona crisis. Remember 2020, the gas prices went down to $2 per million BTU from a level between six and eight dollars per billion BTU where it was uh, the previous years. The oil price went down to, the Brent price at least, went down to 25 BC, uh, uh, dollar per barrel from levels uh, at twice, more than twice as high as they were before. As you may remember as an anecdote, uh, uh, WTI even went negative for a few days. Um, so the prices today, the gas prices today are 20 times higher than what they were during the corona, and they are five to seven times higher than the, what they were over the last years. Uh, gas prices, they do not only react to, 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 to supply shocks, they also very strongly react to demand shocks. Now, of course, if we reduce strongly demand, and we have done this experience two years ago, this is also positive for the climate. This is also coherent with the climate uh, 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 approaches we need to take. What we definitely should not do is what our politicians have tried to do because they got nervous, is to, is to, is to subsidize prices for everybody. I'm not against subs having targeted subsidized subsidies for the poor, but I and most of you, we do not need to be subsidized. Yes, for targeted subsidies for the poor, not for subsidies for everybody, not for watering can money. Now we know that by in Europe, by reducing the thermostat by one degree, we can save 10 BCM of gas demand a year. We reduce it by two degrees and we take on a warmer pullover. We have already reduced by 20 BCM gas demand. We don't necessarily, when I was young, nobody had the air conditioning and somehow we survived. So I think we could survive also today if we, if we reduce, uh, if we uh, increase the temperature uh, in the summertime and we use less air conditioning. How to implement these measures? Our, our uh, electricity and gas suppliers, they know perfectly well what we have consumed in the past. We could put in place a system whereby if we reduce consumption significantly, we get a, a, a rebate of the gas and electricity prices, while if we do not uh, reduce consumption, we have an increase uh, of uh, uh, the price. Uh, we know also need to reduce oil consumption, not only gas consumption. Uh, uh, and the COVID pandemic has shown us that the most activities 
can be carried out perfectly by working online and by not commuting on a daily basis to our workplace. Most meetings can be done online. We also probably need to do some rationing. People who are my age, they may remember in the in the in the in the eighty in the seventies and, and partly in the in the in the eighties we had uh, Sunday free cars and uh, later alternative driving depending on uh, the even pair or even number plate you had. So it was possible there. I don't understand why it should not be possible now. We need a mixture of incentives and command control measures. Uh, I think we need to be bullish on demand approaches, even though these are unpopular. They can be done. A major gas crisis is very real, and we need to be prepared. We have seen during the pandemic that people do accept and do follow restrictions if they understand why they, they are there, and, and therefore we need to do so. It is too easy for governments to address only supply approaches, which are important, but which, but which are, are, are more difficult for them to, 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 to implement than demand approaches. If it is the demand approaches which will bring down prices immediately. And, uh, and this is what we need to do if you want to, to give this, you want to have a contribution and stopping the price. And if we want to, to, to be solidarity with the Ukrainians and not just paying lip service. A last point, it's, I have spoken a lot about governments. It's not only about governments, it's only about all of us. The beauty about the demand responses is that at the end of the day, it's us individually which take the decision and we, we can all play a role in this. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Manfred. Quite insightful. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, I think we had a question about our inner future scenarios, maybe for you, uh, Quentin. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much details on the scenarios themselves. Um, there's a lot of assumptions here. I only presented the, 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 the results on natural gas demand from the final demand sectors, right? But there's a lot of assumptions that are made, results that are made across the whole energy system to make sure that we, in the energy green scenario, that we have a, an energy system that's compatible with the, the temperature increase of, you know, below two degrees Celsius. And the question was on whether, like, which one is the most realistic? Like, it's, it's a bit difficult to say. We don't really assess um, how realistic one is. My personal opinion is that, Energy green is 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 obviously like I said in the in the, in, the, in the, my text answer that it's, it's, it it would be wishful thinking to say that energy green is is the most realistic scenario. I'm 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 hoping that we can we can you know um, reproduce something like that, but I'm I'm not very very optimistic. Energy blue I think is is uh, something that could be accomplished, but we have again we have to take very seriously um, the, the 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 need to act very quickly. So now we have this these talks around reducing demand, but the, like I said earlier, the, the, these are seen as an emergency response as, as what's currently going on. And I think this should be something that's much, much more, that should be, that should be implemented more, much more sustainably and uh, as a way to, to reduce energy consumption as a whole and not just demand. And I think Manfred talked about, like, some of these are true. They're, they're very, you know, they're, they're, they are issues with public opinion. But I think there's also a lot of co-benefits uh, with a lot of these measures, um, and I think we should table on that. I think every measure, um, you know, every every sector, every type of energy use has probably different incentives to be to be implemented. Uh, so it it would be a, a mix of different policies and incentives. I think that would be needed uh, to get to there. Thanks very much, Quentin. Um, Christian, maybe I will leave you the floor. Um, I do not see additional questions. There, there is, there is one or two actually. Yeah, it's it's coming up. It's coming up. Ah, okay. I think we can take you know one or two questions max, and then we'll wrap up. Can you see them, Morgan? Do you want me to? 
Um, now I can see that there is a comment uh, that uh, the UK have recently trial um, some consumer demand shifting, which was very uh, fairly successful. Uh, so maybe it could be extended at a larger scale. Um, yeah. And then uh, I don't know, Manfred, if you want to react on is there any me mechanisms you can trigger stocks, blocking industries, concrete measures, um, additional that compared to what was presented in the um, repo EU plan, maybe some concrete actions. Uh, yes, let me just see that. Um, the, the European Commission has already uh, uh, implemented uh, a, a, a request uh, to to have the the uh, storages eighty percent full before the winter. Um, blocking industry, I don't understand what uh, what is meant. Uh, uh, but uh, we, my point here is, uh, and uh, of course, Kanté is right when he says that uh, there are a lot of co benefits. Obviously, there are. And of course, we should go in this direction. But uh, um, uh, if people do not follow you, remember Gilets Jaunes, that the decisions were correct, but people did not understand. Yeah. It. Yellow the communication jackets. was not right. So, um, uh, you, we need to find uh, approaches that, that convincing that, convincing people that this is uh, important. And uh, there is uh, somebody asking for cloning and gas. Yes, there are plenty of uh, supply approaches as well, which uh, need to be and can be uh, uh, emergency situations like cloning and gas, uh, provided the people and the Dutch accept it. Uh, uh, also, the two German uh, nuclear power plants, which for some reason the Germans have said no, no, no. But there have been so many U-turns already this year that, uh, that we could expect another U-turn if the grass crisis uh, becomes uh, real. And, uh, and uh, uh, for, the, for the short term, the, the crisis, uh, the war is going to be very negative uh, for the climate. On the longer run, at least in Europe, I think it's going to be positive because we will reinforce our green policies. Worldwide, it may be a much more complex uh, issue because uh, the, the supply chains uh, uh, are, are really uh, complex, difficult, and uh, we may have uh, a lot of issues worldwide, but that's the story of another webinar. Uh, thanks, Manfred. Uh, so, so, so I think we've, uh, we've reached the end of this uh, webinar. There's uh, other questions coming up, but We'll be answering by email, and and you know by the way, uh, feel free to, to to ask any other question that you may have by email uh, at research at nodata.net. Research at nodata.net. Also, somebody asked the question as to whether the uh, presentation would be made available to you. The answer is yes. You're going to be receiving uh, probably tomorrow or later, to the day after tomorrow. You're going to be receiving by email um, the presentation, uh, and. Yeah, and feel free to, to browse our website uh, and you, you will be able to uh, access at least, at least some of, of the data that was uh, used to produce this, this webinar and, and also take a look at or, um, uh, or, or um, in the future projections. So obviously you won't be able to see, to view uh, all the data sets, but just, it's just part of it and register to the, the trial version of our platform. Uh, and you'll be able to reach our, you know, to, to download our other uh, publicly available pieces of analysis. Uh, so thanks very much, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, and uh, see you next time then. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.